Good afternoon, everyone. I am Aaron Pollitt, the Provincial Head for Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at Cancer Care Ontario. I'm the head of the Canadian Association of Pathologists, the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, and Cancer Ontario. I would welcome everyone to today's C Cancer Protocol Education Session on Colorectal Cancer. Before we introduce our speaker and we get underway, I have to take care of a few housekeeping items. The session is being recorded. The link to the recording will be circulated to all participants via email when it becomes available. Both the presentation and the recorded presentation are eligible for CME credits. Information for obtaining credits can be found in the session notices. The C certificates for each education session will only be issued for one month from the presentation date. Please to the session notice for the exact deadline. Note that everyone's line has been automatically muted for this presentation. Presentation. Large number of participants, and will not be able to troubleshoot WebEx issues as part of this call. If you are experiencing technical difficulties, please call the WebEx support line. We invite you to submit questions at any time during the presentation using the chat feature. Instructions can be found in the session notice. During the question and answer portion of the presentation, I will pose the submit questions on your behalf for as long as time permits and the order in which they appear chat window, please include the following information. Your institution, your name, and question. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. David Aper. Dr. Aper is an assistant professor in the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at University of British Columbia, head of the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at Vancouver General Hospital, practices as a gastrointestinal pathologist. Dr. Aper obtained his medical degree from the Johann Gutenberg University in Mainz, Germany, Agency Program in Anatomical Pathology in Vancouver. He completed his gastrointestinal pathology fellowship at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto. Dr. Aper is co-director of the Pancreas Center BC and also heads the Gastrointestinal Biobank at VGH. He has a research program focusing predominantly on translational research in colonic and pancreatic cancer. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Schaefer to give today's talk on colorectal cancer. Well, thank you very much, Erin. Uh, it's a great pleasure and, and honor to be here, and thank you very much for these uh, very kind introductory words. So I, I, I've been tasked to give you an update on colorectal cancer pertaining to uh, the 8th edition, and we all had a couple of months now with the 8th edition being checked and have uh, learned some of the positives and maybe also some of the negatives. But I think in summary, uh, the good news is uh, the changes aren't traumatic, um, but there's definitely some areas that uh, deserve some more attention and highlighting, and, and that's really what I was uh, trying to do over the next hour and then uh, answer your questions. Uh, so also, I don't have any uh, disclosures uh, pertaining uh, to this particular topic. So with this in mind, I, I really wanted to uh, spend a couple of minutes going over uh, colon cancer and, and where we stand in Canada. We've been fortunate that uh, Canadian cancer statistics have just been published at the, uh, 2017. I really go into uh, some of the areas that, um, as I mentioned, uh, changes or, or deserve some attention, and that's mainly the grading of colon cancer, the importance of venous agent, also involved and then discuss uh, how tumor deposits definition have yet again changed in the AIDS edition. And then spend a, a good amount of time uh, focusing on malignant polyps and, and mainly um, how to look at the submucosal invasion, uh, the depth, and uh, also touching a bit about on the width, and then uh, tumor budding, and then lastly finish off with uh, some of the lithium screening and the molecular testing that uh, uh, I don't think we can close our eyes uh, upon uh, much longer. So let's start right away with uh, where we are in 2017 uh, with colorectal cancer in Canada. So this data, as I mentioned, published in 2017 from the Canadian Cancer Statistics, and colorectal cancer overall remains the second most common new indication of colon cancer, as you can see on the slide here, but also is the second most common cause of death in males, certainly second to breast in, in, in women. So look at absolute numbers, uh, new cases overall in Canada uh, are still in the uh, 28,000 uh, range. Incidence rates higher in males and females. 
But what I wanted to draw your attention to is the five-year net survival. So we're currently sitting at 63% and 65% from males. That is quite impressive because if you go back about a decade to that, these numbers were in the 50% range. So definitely have seen an increase, and there is, uh, there is uh, continued uh, hope uh, that this uh, number can increase. But thanks uh, that we have uh, maybe subjectively uh, experienced over the last little while is a rise in colorectal cancer in younger uh, um, patients. And uh, this is a graph representing the percent of cases for all malignancies per age group. And if you look over here, not surprisingly, colorectal cancer is the largest portion in 85 plus years, comes down a bit and starts really to uh, be uh, in the double digit range at 50 years of age. But there's also a not insubstantial amount of colorectal cancer being diagnosed in as young as 15 to 29 and 30 to 49. And subjective, maybe we have all encountered these uh, very young patients with colorectal cancer. And in fact, there's objective evidence that there's a sharp rise in colon cancer and rectal cancer among young adults. This is data uh, from our neighbors to the south. Uh, looking uh, at a very large cohort of patients and just published in 2017. And, uh, what you can see here is the rate per 100,000 of persons, uh, incidence rate of colon cancer down and plotted against the birth cohort, patients born between those years. And draw your attention to these two, uh, the blue and the orange one down here. And although there is a bit of variation in the curve, there's a general and upward trend, especially if you compare to higher age. It's more pronounced within the rectum, where we're seeing more and more rectal cancers within younger age patients. And I think it's uh, important to mention that not every early onset colorectal cancer is hereditary. In fact, there's a separate subset almost of early onset colorectal cancer. And uh, this is a very nice meta-analysis uh, looking at that. And uh, I just draw your attention here to the uh, microsatellite instability status uh, within this cohort. And if they would be hereditary, one would expect this to be in a much higher percentage range than it is. So it is, uh, it is uh, fair enough to state that while early onset colorectal cancer has a familiar component, more often than late onset uh, disease, the majority of cases are still sporadic. So um, if we want to go back and increase that uh, number of five-year uh, net survival rate, uh, part of what we need to understand more is what, how early onset colorectal cancer is different and what we can learn from that uh, patient cohort to uh, have better and uh, more uh, uh, directed treatment for this cohort. And thought uh, in that notion, this was a very interesting paper uh, that was just published uh, a month ago in gastroenterology uh, which was determining the risk of colorectal cancer and starting age of screening based on lifestyle and environmental and genetic factors. And it really challenges what we currently do in terms of our colorectal cancer prevention strategies, where it goes in and gets a fit or a called blood test, uh, start at a strict age range of 50 years. And looking at a large cohort, they identified uh, genetic variants, and they gave that a G-score, and 19 lifestyle and environmental factors. And that was ranging from uh, sedentary lifestyle to diet, you name it. All of these were taken together into a single score. And then based on whether you had family history or no family history in a man, your starting age of the colonoscopy could be as early as 38 years of age or with no family history could be early um, as in the 45 years of range. So all of this is to say that uh, individualized colorectal cancer prevention strategies that may very well be on the horizon. So with all in mind, really, um, despite decrease in the overall five-year net survival rate, we as pathologists cannot escape the reporting of colorectal cancer specimens, and it's here for us today. So throughout this presentation, I will be referring to the AGCC 8 editions, which uh, most of you are now quite familiar with, but all the CAP guidelines, and namely the version 4001, uh, which was uh, posted in June 2017, but incorporated all the eighth edition that came into effect in January 1st of 2018. So I'll start right away with the grading of uh, colon cancer. And, and um, 
much of the dismay of, of, of many of us, uh, we are now back to a four-tiered system. So the two-tiered system, which uh, you may recall of grade versus high-grade colorectal cancer, where low-grade incorporated both well and moderately differentiated, and high-grade was reserved to poorly and um, in, in some cases undifferentiated, we are now back to a four-tiered system. It's not based on science uh, because the science does tell us that there is a clear difference between the well-moderated and the um, or the low-grade and the high-grade encompassing um, moderately and uh, poorly differentiated. But rather, if you read uh, AGCC and CAP guidelines, uh, the decision was made to return to a four-tiered system because it was more commonly used in other solid tumors within the luminal gastrointestinal tract as well as um, uh, some of the solid gastrointestinal lesions. And such AGCC has specified and asked uh, to use the four-tier system to prevent errors in data recording. Um, you can like it or not like it, but if one does follow the CAP guidelines, we're now back to the four-tier system. And we already had uh, very animated discussions with the oncologists um, on, on that topic, and I'm sure you all will have the same discussion. Um, importance of, of venous invasion. Venous invasion in colorectal cancer, as you know, in the CAP guideline and in the HECC is very much highlighted, and we now separate lymphovascular invasion uh, since the seventh edition, so there hasn't been any change there between small and large vessels. There has been a bit of a change is that in large vessel, we now clearly stipulate as to whether the invasion is intramural or extramural. And I put here for you exactly the wording of uh, note E pertaining to lymphovascular invasion in the CAP guidelines. And uh, I wanted to highlight a few aspects here. Tumor involving endothelial line spaces with an identified smooth muscle layer or elastic lamina is considered venous, i.e. large vessel invasion. Subscribed tumor nodules surrounded by an elastic lamina on H&E or elastic stain are also considered venous invasion. So that's going to be very important. In a second, we're going to talk about uh, tumor deposits. Also want to point out that extramural venous invasion has been demonstrated in several analyses to an independent adverse prognostic factor in multiple studies and a risk factor for liver metastasis. No study demonstrates that better than uh, the study from Roxbury et al., where they looked at 419 colorectal cancers. And you can see that in those patients uh, with no venous invasion, the overall survival rate was relatively good. But there was a clear difference between venous invasion, both intramural and extramural, with extramural being the worst. So I took the liberty of taking this data and actually plotting it by stage at the AGCC 8th edition as to whether venous invasion was absent or present. Now, remember, the staging system, the T and N, does not include venous invasion. And I just draw your attention to the five-year survival rate as a traumatic decrease in the five-year survival rate as venous invasion is present. So venous invasion is truly a very important factor that uh, we have to include in our reports, and oncologists are actively looking for it. We are fortunate in Canada that we have had uh, excellent work being done, uh, mainly by Dr. Strymon and Kirsch out of Ontario. And if you have not done so, I, I encourage you to read um, uh, one of their papers. Uh, this is their 2012 paper, uh, which really goes into the intricacies of detecting venous invasion. What I brought to your attention was in Table 3 is that um, they demonstrated that in multiple cohorts, venous invasion detection rate was actually much higher if you used an elastic stain. Uh, Messenger went on to uh, go to the UK, and uh, I was um, uh, uh, pleased to uh, find out that in the RC pathology in the UK, 30% uh, venous invasion detection rate is in colorectal cancer is actually a quality metric. Um, I'm aware of that being uh, written in Stone Canada, but, but uh, I'm happy to hear a different uh, in Roxbury's uh, previous study in 2010, he also demonstrated to ask the question, is H&E um, alone sufficient to assess for venous invasion, or should you be doing both? And again, there was a slight but significant difference um, between 
uh, venous invasions absence in the five-year survival rate if you were doing an elastic stain together with an H&E stain or only an H&E stain. So the trend here really is, is that uh, H&E and elastin stain uh, should be the place to identify a venous invasion. I wish at this point not to also point something out uh, from the uh, Canadian uh, lead paper on how you actually section a tumor. And it makes a lot of sense if you um, focus or, or, or remind yourself that the anatomical distribution of the mesocolic veins uh, comes uh, in the perpendicular section to the tumor. So if we use a plane of section going down like this, we miss a lot of the mesocolic veins. So a lot of um, advocacy has been surrounding uh, changing uh, actually your grossing techniques to have a more tangential section at the area of deepest invasion within the colorectal cancer to really ensure uh, that you get uh, the largest denominator possible to identify uh, invasion in mesocolic veins. If you're not aware of that yet or haven't tried it, I encourage you uh, to, to look up this paper where um, they have very nice um, um, outline on how to go about that. Some of the um, Morphologic key features to uh, look for is the orphan artery sign. So an artery sign with a rounded tumor nodule adjacent to it, and your elastin stain clearly demonstrates that this actually does fit within an endothelial line space. Uh, and the other one is the protruding tongue sign. So if you're right here at the interface between the muscularis propria and the periconic adipose tube, often the vessels protrude at space forward, and if you have that protruding sun sign in terms of tumor, that also um, more often than not turns out to be a uh, venous invasion. Moving to uh, serosal involvement, so, uh, clinical colleagues um, are often faced with how to deal with lymph node negative colorectal cancer. And uh, they follow uh, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines, who stipulates that one of the highest features for lymph node negative colorectal cancer is localized perfusion or PT4. Um, now, PT4A, um, we know, uh, is associated with decreased survival. Um, as the NCCN uh, stipulates, it will determine um, adjuvant uh, chemotherapy in lymph node negative colorectal cancers. We also know that it's likely underdiagnosed and that up to 20% of T3 lesions are likely T4A. And again, uh, in the UK, in fact, 20% of T4A is a quality indicator uh, to know the importance of making uh, this diagnosis. So what the uh, ACCC edition say about uh, T4A? Well, they again uh, classify a similar or almost identical to seventh edition that those tumors characterized by involvement of the serosal surface, so the bristle peritoneum by direct tumor extension should be called T4A. And that just with perforation in which the tumor cells are continuous with the serosal surface through inflammation are also considered to be T4A. There are uh, continue to be somewhat coy as to discuss the significance of tumor that is within one millimeter from the serosal surface and accompanied by a serosal resection. And uh, what they leave us with is advice that multiple level sections and or additional blocks uh, should be examined. So at this point where we have to discuss uh, the, um, at least in my division, famous scraping study. And uh, this was a study um, as, uh, led by uh, Dr. Yentis in, in 2013. And it was a very uh, simple question asked. What they did, they took 100 patients uh, had either PT3 with more than one millimeter from the serosal margin or within one millimeter or clear PT4, and then they scrape the peritoneal surface prior uh, to um, grossing and handling the specimen further. So those tumors that were more than one millimeter from the serosal margin, there was nothing in the serosal scraping and there no uh, peritoneal recurrence and follow-up. That were within one millimeter of the serosal margin, up to 50% had tumor in the serosal scraping, and percent actually had peritoneal recurrence, which is not too different if you look at what the T4A uh, lesions were showing, and this was 55% had tumor in the serosal scraping, 18% had peritoneal recurrence. So with this in mind, let's maybe apply some um, 
common sense as to the issue of T4A versus T3. So the reaction uh, of the lesion within one millimeter of the cell motion consists of a small rim of fibrosis. Uh, in my opinion, PT3 is very appropriate. If, however, uh, the reaction is only fibrin or inflammatory cells, hyperplastic mesothelium only separates the tumor from the cirrhosis surface, and you have done sufficient uh, enough deeper levels to not identify a smaller rim of fibrosis, then PT4A is very appropriate in this setting. Now, mindful that the PT4A category is applicable to the non-peritonealized portions of the colorectum. Here's some examples. Uh, so I think nobody would argue that this is a PT3. Uh, here's your tumor, uh, very mucin rich. And over here, you have the cirrhosis surface. There's a lot of um, inflammatory reaction going on here. You can see up to here, there may have been inking seep in there, but there's still good enough distance, more than a millimeter, uh, and even fibrosis here present to uh, put this into a PT3 category. Here's another high power example of a different case. Uh, trends right here, and uh, there's your ink, just rose the margin, but this is clearly um, uh, fibrosis here, and, and this would fall within PT3. Now, it's a bit more challenging. Uh, again, there's ink present here, you have your cirrhosis surface. There's two up to here, but really um, no fibrosis is present. All of this is inflammatory cells, uh, maybe some fibrin present. So in books, uh, this would be within the PT4A category. The example of a PT4A, and this is really to remind yourself to be mindful of the cleft and look at them. So although um, uh, this rosa is from here, it follows along the cleft, and you can see that there's a tumor nodule sitting right here uh, within one millimeter of the uh, cirrhosa, and here's a high power view with it. There is hyperplastic epithelial cells and uh, several lymphocytes stacked on top of each other, not a fibroblast to be seen. So this, again, in my books, would fall within the PT4A level, provided you have done enough serial sections to not identify uh, another uh, area of rim. So I want to uh, tumor deposits, and this is uh, certainly an area where there has been uh, quite a bit of change uh, in the HSCC 8th edition in comparison to the 7th edition. Um, and uh, really, if one goes back, the change has been going on since the 6th edition. So if bringing you back, the 6th edition, we talked about smooth contours, that was functional metastasis, irregular contours, there was a tumor deposit. Um, we talked about V1 and V2. Thankfully, we dropped that in the seventh edition, and we became more clearly as what was a tumor deposit. Really, it was a, decrease, a discrete focus of tumor in the pericolor fat away from the leading edge of the tumor and showing no evidence of residual lymph node tissue. And uh, the N1C was introduced uh, for those tumors that did not have any other lymph node metastasis in the setting of the tumor deposit. Now, eighth edition really maintains the definition of a tumor deposit, uh, other to say and to add that there should be no vascular structure present within a tumor. It also still maintains the N1C. So talk about a bit as to what that vascular structure uh, with the tumor deposit means and how it does impact staging AGCC eighth edition. So we're coming back to the slide in a second. But I want to point out um, some of the issues with tumor deposits. And um, I'm showing you this paper here, and it's, it's a bit dated now in 2014. Um, the title, um, and you can only imagine those pathologists sitting around the room debating the deposit. Uh, they actually went back to even the fifth ed edition, where it was uh, based on the size criteria for tumor deposits, and then um, uh, subject the expert panel to several examples um, of uh, tumor deposits to determine the inter-observer agreement. And what they used as criteria, which I still think are very good criteria for a lymph node or round shape, a thickal, a peripheral lymphoid follicles or rim, uh, which would be absent in the tumor deposit, uh, which had an irregular shape, no thick capsule, none of those lymphoid follicles or rims, uh, and also, they excluded uh, perineural invasion and venous invasion. 
attention. So with that in mind, I think for, for most of us, uh, these uh, examples are very uh, good examples for lymph node metastasis. Do note the shape and the thick capsule. You can make out the lymphocyte rim or even follicles in most of them. And even the expert panel agreed in seven out of seven reviewers agreement that these are, in fact, lymph node metastasis. These are the prototypical perfect examples of tumor deposits that you want to publish. And so they did, and they were also in agreement uh, here that all of these are uh, two posits based on their irregular shape, the lack of lymphocyte rim, the lack of any vascular or perineural uh, asia. But these things uh, are not easy all the time. And you can see that even the uh, reviewers or the experts uh, disagreed uh, for some of them. This is a tumor deposit. Uh, but not all of them were in agreement. And part of the problem is where there are areas where you could argue there's a thicker core, and there's also areas um, where there are maybe some lymphocyte rims around you. Yeah. The important message that I want to highlight is, is that it is not that easy to always identify a tumor deposit, but it's important to understand what your diagnosis means. How does your diagnosis change if you make the diagnosis of a tumor deposit or lymph node metastasis? Now, in this edition, uh, the key feature that we have to be mindful uh, uh, of uh, is that vascular structures uh, now be excluded from a tumor deposit. And they specifically state that if a tumor is present within a large vessel or its remnant or surrounds a large nerve, then it should not be classified as a tumor deposit. That clearly is a departure as to what was present in the seventh edition. And this change can influence tumor staging. So you how. So the change here really is, is that in the eighth edition, if you have a tumor deposit, you're talking about a PT3N1C. If you have venous invasion, you're talking about a PT3N0, provided there are no other lymph node metastasis. So imagine that there's a T3 tumor with no lymph node metastasis, but with discrete focus of tumor within the pericolonic fat away from the invasive front. So something like this. In the seventh edition, this would be classified as a tumor deposit, and the tumor would be staged as a PT3N1C stage 3. Now, I draw attention to the center of this lesion here, where if you're an astute morphologist, you can make out the remnant of the vascular structure. And now, following the eighth edition, this would not be classified as a tumor deposit, but rather would be staged as a PT3N0 with this invasion. Now, what does that mean for our oncologist? In particular case, again, this is a lymph node negative colorectal cancer, and lymphovascular invasion is one of the high-risk features for, um, uh, for lymph node negative colorectal cancer and the NCCN guidelines. But it's important to note that in those that are stage 2 with venous invasion should be offered adjuvant chemotherapy, and the key word here is should, whereas with the stage 3 will be given adjuvant chemotherapy. So the importance that I want to highlight on this change is that it's important to understand for your oncologists, and most of them do know what the difference is between a stage 2 with or without venous invasion, and you be mindful of making this diagnosis as to what the consequences are uh, once the patient does see uh, the oncologist. Okay, on to uh, malignant polyps. So first, uh, talk about what, what should one report and what are the uh, challenging areas in um, uh, malignant polyps. And, and I think uh, in, in 2018, um, sh one should report are, are these six things, and uh, I'll put a bit of a bracket around number five and I explain to you why. But let's go to list. So presence or absence of poorly differentiated carcinoma, any amount, needs to go into the pathology report. Uh, the presence or absence of angiolymphatic invasion, most definitely. The presence or absence of high-grade tumor budding, and we'll be talking about this uh, in depth. Uh, following that, the depth of invasion in millimeter, um, I think, uh, deserves uh, uh, attention. Uh, depth of invasion is the one where we put a bracket around, but I explain to you why that is. And then lastly, the distance of the invasive component to margin. And really, the challenging areas are is the depth and width of invasion, how to measure, what is the cutoff for surgery, and tumor budding, how to measure, and what is the cutoff for surgery again for that. Now, we're all uh, uh, 
it's important for all of us to remind ourselves um, why uh, pathology assessment of malignant polyps is so important, because really the question that the endoscopist uh, is faced when identifying a malignant polyp is uh, to resect or not to resect. And many things uh, that uh, go on, or many patients that go on not to have a resection is not based on our pathology report, but it may be things that we have no idea about, such as comorbidities or quality of life. But what we can directly influence is the risk of positive regional lymph nodes. And what we need to ask uh, in that setting and what we need to guide um, the clinician is, is, does the risk of surgery outweigh the risk of metastatic disease? I think, and I'm not alone in that, and the literature supports me, that this pathologist can be guiding uh, that decision very clearly. Uh, and um, in malignant polyps, uh, the innovation that has become available over the last uh, couple of years has been good enough now to be very firm in asking anybody to consider making uh, these recommendations in their reports. So let's start with depth of evasion and risk of regional lymph node metastasis. So the largest study uh, that really uh, we had to get uh, from, um, uh, or that we based this on was uh, from Moreno's study uh, in 2004, uh, where they assessed the depth of submucosal invasion um, in, uh, in the follow-up nodal involvement, and the threshold that came out was two millimeter for tumor depth. And point out there have been many follow-up studies, uh, most of them uh, coming out of uh, uh, Japan, uh, but there have been North American studies uh, as um, late as last year. Um, and really, over time, the depth of submucosal invasion has changed. We, we have identified that uh, two millimeter may have been too liberal, uh, and more and more studies have been going up to, uh, to one millimeter of tumor depth of invasion. And I'm showing you in this table, and you're more than welcome to look at it afterwards, is the number of node negatives versus the percentage of node positive cases based on the depth of submucosal invasion. How does one measure the depth of submucosal invasion? Uh, again, uh, we are fortunate to have the Japanese, uh, Japanese literature, which is very good in, in guiding us in, in this particular area. And uh, I would um, draw your attention uh, to a paper in 2016 in Modern Path, where we um, actually have this very nice uh, uh, pictogram guiding you through. So if you have a vanculated tumor, you identify Haggard's line or muscularis uh, um, cozy, and then you measure uh, the depth from there. Uh, so in this example over here, right, you would follow the muscularis and cozy along. Uh, you can make it out here. Here's your deepest point of uh, tumor, uh, so we'd measure it there. Uh, if you don't identify the muscular mitosis as a non pedunculated lesion, uh, the tumor thickness can be measured. Now, this is where I would be mindful as to m make sure that the depth of Asian is clearly articulated into your report as to how you've measured it. Again, uh, if we uh, look for guidelines, uh, the uh, Japanese uh, Society for uh, uh, Colorectal Cancer um, has uh, uh, published these guidelines in March of last year. And, uh, in the setting of a negative vertical margin, or in North America, we would refer to this as a negative deep margin, a depth of invasion of less than one millimeter uh, would um, put a patient into a surveillance category, whereas a depth of one millimeter independent of poor tumor differentiation, lymphovascular invasion, mucinous carcinoma, or uh, tumor budding, which we'll get to, uh, would consider uh, this patient for uh, a partial uh, infection. Um, so, uh, important to note that a deep margin obviously uh, would um, have to push patient on for a resection, whether this is by local means uh, or complete resection is, uh, is a different topic. So I told you that they would put a bracket around width of invasion. Um, now, width of invasion was identified in Ueno's initial index study at a total of four millimeter uh, across uh, the uh, invasive component in the submucosa. Um, the problem with it is obviously is uh, where do you measure and how deep have you cut into the block and you artificial change that. And uh, for that, with the invasion hasn't gained that much traction, uh, it's 
most definitely not mentioned yet in CAP or AGCC um, edition. However, it's definitely something that is gaining traction. I wanted to draw your attention uh, to a paper that uh, I thought was very interesting because it took the area of submucosal invasion to a new level. And uh, here's a good example of a, a PT1 lesion. You can see the deep, or if we would be in pan vertical margin, down here being clear of tumor, and there's this very uh, large component of invasive colorectal cancer. But in study, the authors um, actually measured the um, area of submucosal invasion, uh, so moving to a two-dimensional um, assessment, and they identified that 35 millimeters squared was associated uh, with an increased risk of regional lymph node metastasis. Um, but if you do read their paper, you also realize that the width of carcinoma here was higher than what was reported by Ueno in earlier studies at 11.5 millimeter. So I think width invasion is, is not quite ready for prime time everywhere. Uh, I think if, if you and, and your unit are, are comfortable with uh, assessing it, understand the limitations, and most importantly, you have educated your endoscopists and surgeons and oncologists on the importance of assessing uh, this parameter in malignant polyp, then it's definitely worth considering uh, including it. So tumor budding. Uh, I think tumor budding uh, definitely represents uh, one of the larger changes. Uh, that has come up uh, in, uh, in the CAP guidelines. So it's, uh, tumor budding. Uh, so tumor budding is, um, is assessed at the invasive front uh, of colorectal cancer. So this is a histogram of the invasive front over here. And um, uh, you can look out in, uh, away from the invasive front on your power that there's actually epithelial uh, cells sprinkles around um, the um, peritumor reaction. So what is tumor butt? The definition of a tumor butt is that of individual cells and or small clusters of tumor cells at the front of a colonic adenocarcinoma. So you can think about it if you're very much into botany as the blossoming um, budding flower or coming off from it. It's just that the tumor grows with this being the front. If you're um, uh, terry inclined like me, you could think about it like the... Uh, any sniper that uh, goes into, or, or the, the sniper that goes into enemy territory beyond the enemy's lines. Uh, whatever you like, uh, but think about it as the tumor spreading out and actually growing. We have uh, enough evidence now in the literature to uh, convince most of us that uh, tumor budding does have uh, clinical significance in isolation of other high-risk features within the polyp and um, all in uh, stage two colorectal cancer. So is tumor budding stuff really going to stay around? Yes, it is. There was a generalized, uh, or there was a period of, of grieving and the note should have come to an end. And to this note, there was an international tumor budding consensus conference, the ITBCC in uh, Switzerland in, in 2016, who uh, provided us uh, with some consensus statement and strong recommendation based on uh, what is available within the literature, meaning that tumor budding is an independent predictor of lymph node metastasis in PT1 colorectal cancer. Tumor should be counted on h and &E. Tumor budding is assessed in the hotspot at the invasive front. So AGCC uh, mentions it in the reference, and CAP actually uh, makes it an optional component now in uh, node F. Uh, if you look at it very clearly, and they also give us um, very clear guidelines uh, how to assess uh, tumor budding. Go over uh, these guidelines because uh, they are very welcome, uh, and they have been almost uh, adopted one-to-one -one from the International Tumor Budding Consensus Conference because the literature has been um, uh, there have been too many scoring systems published, and it really made it's very difficult uh, to come up uh, with a reproducible uh, way of measuring tumor budding as well as of communicating it. Uh, based on the uh, consensus conference and its adoption in CAP, we are now in a position to actually report tumor budding in a unified way. So first off, uh, we have to um, explain um, how, uh, what the area of this is. So the area that um, 
the consensus uh, guidelines now stipulate is um, 7.85 millimeters squared. The issue is, is that 7.8 millimeter 5 squared is great if you use the objective magnification of 20 and your eyepiece diameter is 20. So I encourage you to look at your microscope. You may be able to do this right now since you're sitting to it, listening to me. Uh, what is the eyepiece diameter on your scope? Most scopes in America, and mine included, have an eyepiece diameter of 22 millimeters. So that means if you use a 20 objective to a which are budding, in order to achieve the area that you want to look for, you actually have to employ a normalization factor of 1.210. So bear with me for a second. We'll get back to that. So how is this going to help you uh, in actually assessing tumor budding? It's much more complicated, or it sounds much more complicated than an actual TS. So find the, the area of objectives that you have and what your normalization factor is, and then you identify the h &E slide with the greatest degree of budding at the invasive front on, on low power. Uh, if it's a surgical resection, you scan with a 10 times the objective and you identify that hotspot, uh, the area where you are most likely at the highest number of tumor budding, where there's the deepest, most juiciest point of, of um, invasive front, and then use your 20th objective and you start counting. Now, if you have your tumor budding count, that you have your 20 objective, and if your 20 objective does not fall within an IP diameter of 20, you then divide this by your normalization factor, which I have identified in the table over here, and you get your budding count per 0 0.785 millimeter squared. And if you look up guidelines, they actually ask you that you include this as your denominator um, in uh, your final report. This is the easy scenario of tumor budding. You can see here's the invasive front, and in this particular case, it's very easy because there are these very helpful um, black squares here. of these are tumor buds. What do you do if it's not so easy uh, in the challenging scenario? So if there's fragmentation, if there's a strong looseness component, if there's inflammation, at the eighth of front or very prominent stromal cells. Remember, the consensus uh, recommendations were to count on H and E, and we have to count on H and E, but we cannot um, close our eyes to using the possibility of uh, a cytokeratin stain to guide us to identify uh, which one of those uh, lesions may, in fact, have tumor budding that then go back on the H and E stain to count. And you can see that. And the inflammatory component here it very clearly answers the question that all of this is inflammation and that there's no um, uh, malignant cells present within that area. Yeah. I do mention this study because uh, every time I talk about this, I'm fascinated and reminded by it. Uh, this is uh, a study, uh, again, from Japan where they looked at uh, tumor budding cases. They actually did cytokine stain, but they did serial sections, up to 200 serial sections. Uh, through the block, uh, must have been a very uh, diligent resident. And what they identified is that lots of those uh, tumor butts actually had these little pseudofragments. I um, would encourage you next time you do a cytokeratin stain, look for them. There are many kind of artifacts in staining, but in fact what they are is the tip of the iceberg uh, that that tumor butt denotes as it uh, leaves the invasive tumor. So budding, again, uh, following the Japanese guideline, just like depth of invasion, if you have low-grade tumor budding, so less than four butts uh, per 7.845 uh, meters squared, uh, the patient falls into surveillance. However, if you're into the grade two and three, so here in the malignant polyps, uh, the dichotomy of low versus high-grade tumor budding is favored in Japanese literature. This a patient may be considered for a um, more definitive uh, surgical procedure. So peritumor budding is, is not mentioned in the AGCC edition in the text. It's mentioned in the references. But then TAP cancer protocol has now been added as recommended, but not mandatory, as you showed you in note F. And the following settings, so it's cancer rising in the polyps, PT1, since it helps assess for the risk of lymph metastasis and need for surgery, and stage two colorectal cancer does help to select patients for adjuvant chemotherapy. So going back to our 
list of NCCN high risk factors for lymph node negative colorectal cancers. High grade tumor budding is not included there yet. Um, so, this is really something that we have to be advocates as to uh, that uh, feature with our clinical colleagues, um, uh, given that it's not included. Um, remind them that most studies have shown poor overall and disease free survival for patients with stage 2 colorectal cancer and high grade tumor budding. And uh, recognize the reluctance of uh, the oncologist um, that uh, uh, they always point out that variable methods had been used to assess tumor budding, and not all studies include multivariable assessment. Now that we have a unified approach for that, uh, we can do these uh, multivariable uh, assessments on a larger cohort and hopefully uh, remove the recommended uh, status that is currently present in the CAP guidelines with one of the next iterations. So uh, up to this point, uh, I think some of the uh, uh, summaries or take-home points I, I wanted to point out to you before we go into Lynch syndrome is the, that the tier grading scheme is no longer advocated. Uh, penis invasion should be recorded in resection specimen and elastic stains uh, should be performed. Uh, liberal in ordering CO sections to assess cholesterol's involvement. Be mindful of your TRA um, diagnostic rate. Uh, addition of tumor deposits has changed uh, yet again. And, and be mindful of vascular remnants or so perineural remnants uh, with the tumor deposits. And tumor budding is a strong predictor of some metastasis in PT1 colorectal cancer and overall outcomes, and uh, as mentioned, um, should uh, be uh, uh, reported in an optional uh, fashion. To uh, Lynch syndrome and uh, molecular testing. So very fortunate uh, that uh, there has been a uh, guidelines um, published on molecular biomarkers for the evaluation of colorectal cancer. This is a joint effort by uh, multiple societies to establish guidelines uh, for molecular evaluation uh, in colorectal cancer, and they came up with an unbelievable uh, 21 recommendation. And I have 13 minutes left. No, I will not go through all 21 recommendations. I, I wanted to highlight a few of them for you. Um, and uh, one I thought uh, was very uh, important is that members of the patient's clinical team, including pathologists, may molecular testing, so be shy. Uh, what should include results and interpretation sections readily understandable by oncologists and pathologists? I can't emphasize uh, the portion enough. I think uh, it is our uh, duty and obligation to ensure that, that persons on the other side reading our report understand it and can interpret it. Talk about Lynch syndrome. What's the definition in clinical presentation? So Lynch syndrome Syndrome, as most of you know, is a germline mutation in DNA repair genes and leads to an accumulation of mutations which may result in malignancy, the key feature here being may. And um, the most common uh, genes affected is MLH1, MSH2, SH6, and PMS2. Um, EPCAM uh, may also, in a very small subset, uh, be um, actually the driving uh, mutation, and uh, this mutation in EPCAN results in epigenetic silencing of the MSH2 gene by half the methylation. So if you have loss of MSH2 and MSH6, it may be involved in a small subset. Lynch is uh, genetically heterogeneous. Uh, it can affect uh, different MMR genes, and it has a penetrance. Uh, now, we have to clearly separate it from HNPCC, which stands for hereditary non polypolar cancer, uh, colorectal cancer. And this is a clinical term for patients with carcinoma that fulfill the Amsterdam one or two clinical criteria. So two more family members, one of whom is a first-degree relative with HNPCC-related cancer, at least two successive generations affected, one cancer diagnosed less than five, 50 years of age and familiar abnormal polyposis should be excluded. So it's important to say that HNPCC doesn't always equal Lynch syndrome because only 50 to 60% of patients with APCC will have confirmed Lynch syndrome. Screen for Lynch syndrome. So you can follow the revised Bethesda guidelines for testing uh, uh, patients. So this is uh, colorectal cancer diagnosed under the uh, 50 years of age, a synchronous from metaculous other Lynch syndrome associated tumors regardless of age or famous SIHI phenotype that we see 
on histology. So this is tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, the mucinous signal differentiation, the medullary growth pattern, or the Bronze-like peritumor lymphocyte reaction. While I just do not discount that these histological features, these morphological differentiations are very helpful in pointing us towards MSI high uh, phenotype within this patient, the sensitivity is only up to 85% in detecting patients with Lynch syndrome. So we can do better than that. So who should we screen then for Lynch syndrome? So we can do universal screening for all patients with colorectal cancer. This is endorsed by a number of organizations. Or we can do selective screening of patients based on an age cutoff. Uh, and fulfilling the revised Bethesda guidelines. So uh, this uh, uh, methodology, which uh, looks at patients less than 70 years or more than 70 years with fulfilling the revised Bethesda guidelines, is also endorsed by a number of organizations. But it's important to note that it misses up to 5% of patients with Lynch syndrome. So you can choose um, one or other strategy of screening for Lynch syndrome I think if uh, one is in the business of identifying those patients with Lynch syndrome and identifying kindreds that are affected by this disease, then really the only answer going forward is universal screening for all patients with colorectal cancer. So the um, guidelines uh, that I mentioned at the beginning uh, recommend in, in uh, a reference to MR that MR status testing in patients with colorectal cancer should be performed for the identification of patients at high risk for Lynch syndrome and or prognostic stratification. We'll talk about this in a second. And then testing can be performed by IHC or by MSI DNA-based testing. So this is a question as to how to screen for Lynch syndrome. We can either do it by MMR or we can do it by microsatellite instability testing by PCR. We both have um, Excellent sensitivities, um, ranging around 95%, but MMR immunohistochemistry chemistry as a screening tool has advantages. It's readily available in pathology laboratories. Uh, C can uh, direct, uh, help to direct germline gene sequencing. And some patients, IHC allows for the distinction between sporadic MMR protein uh, deficiencies and Lynch syndrome. So let's uh, look at uh, uh, MMR IHC uh, for a bit. So here, as I said, a defective MMR gene results in the loss of IHC expression. So this is different than all of our other IHC stains where we look off a positive signal. Here we look for a negative signal, the loss of IHC. If you test all four antibodies, uh, your sensitivity is 92%, and it's similar to uh, MSI PCR-based testing. And some guiding principles for the uh, tumor interpretation. So if you have tumor nuclei scanning in more than 10% of the nuclei, uh, then your protein is preserved. If you have less than 10%, um, then it's equivocal, and you'd have repeat stain or reflex MSI testing. Uh, that uh, holds true, for, especially for MSH2 and MSH6. And if you have complete lack of staining, then you have loss of protein expression. So here's some examples. Uh, uh, here's an MSH6 stain, and you have an internal control in the tumor infiltrating limb Sites, but tumor nuclei do not show any expression, with companion PMS2 and MSH2 showing strong expression with intact control with the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. So how do you interpret your IHC results? So we have loss of MSH2 and MSH6, isolated loss of MSH6, so isolated loss of PMS2, showing you the most likely gene defect. So this is concerned for Lynch syndrome, but not yet diagnostic. And we're going to talk about this in a second. If you ask of MLH1 and PMS2, your most likely defective gene is MLH1. The problem is that this can be seen in sporadic DNA MMR protein expression as well as Lynch syndrome. And you really need to perform BRAF or MLH1 protohypothalamus isolation to determine whether this loss is indicative of a sporadic deficiency or a germline mutation indicative of Lynch syndrome. About uh, BRAF um, uh, for a second, and again, remind yourself of what the uh, guidelines are saying. Uh, should be performed in MMR deficient tumors with loss of MLH1 to evaluate for Lynch syndrome risk. So exactly what I just uh, explained to you. 
And then the presence of BRAS independently favors the sporadic uh, pathogenesis, but it does exclude the low risk of Lynch syndrome or exclude the sporadic pathogenesis. So it's been very complicated uh, to this point. So how can I, um, uh, before we get there as to how we can summarize, let's quickly touch about BRAS. Um, HC, which is now available, and we offered in our lab. So here's Asian colorectal cancer, loss of MLH1 with intact internal control, and very strong expression of BRAS V600E. So important to state again that the BV, a BRAS V600E image is closely linked to MLH promoter hypermyostylation and indicates sporadic MMR deficiency. However, the absence is not by Lynch syndrome, is only 50 to 70 percent of colorectal cancers with MLH1 promoter population harbor the BRFC600 mutations. So I know this is very complicated, so I thought as to how can I convey to you what these results mean taken all together. So bear with me on this, on this slide because I think it's helpful uh, to see as to what the different results uh, actually mean in terms of the patient. So colorectal cancer, including PT1, if MLH1 loss, or MLH1 is deleted, which happens in about 16% of all tests, uh, you then would have to look at the BRAF uh, status. And if BRAF is mutated, which is in about 13%, it's not uh, Lynch syndrome in most of the cases, and these patients actually have a relatively good outcome. If BRAF is one type or not mutated, then it's very likely to be Lynch, and those patients also have an outcome. MMR is intact by IHC, which is about 80% uh, of the cases. Um, B status um, is, is not that helpful in determining whether this is Lynch because you have already done that, but it may be helpful in prognostic, uh, prognostic, uh, in, in prognosis of the patient independently because those patients who have new, um, uh, mutated BRAS um, do not have Lynch, but they have a poor outcome in comparison to those that they are wild type for BRAF. And then lastly, if you have deletions in LH2 and PMS2 and MSH2 deleted, which is the minority of cases, uh, these are likely Lynch patients and BRAF testing really is inconsequential and these patients also often have a very good clinical outcome. Except that I say that these patients are likely for Lynch syndrome because those patients reminding you that MR is a screening tool should be going on to hereditary cancer program to actually confirm that this is, in fact, a uh, patient harboring Lynch syndrome. So report uh, your MR IHC results. Be, be clear in describing what you see. Avoid words like positive and negative, uh, preserved expression and loss of expression. Uh, recommended in the literature as being more um, understandable. Use templates, uh, something like that. But again, as I mentioned earlier, you can go to the CAP templates. Uh, you can come up with your own local templates. It's important that you involve your oncologist on the other side and your surgeon so that they understand and they can read and they know what you mean when you say that. And if there's loss of expression, guide them as to what that means and make the recommendation that this patient, if it falls within the category of a likely germline mutation, should be referred to a hereditary cancer program. Now, the reason there's been such a buzz about uh, MR in colorectal cancer, as well as many other uh, solid gastrointestinal tumors, is because of a paper that was published in 2015 in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, showing that the PD-1 blockade in tumors with uh, mismatch repair deficiency um, was uh, much um, uh, was uh, very good in those patients uh, or, or in patients stratified by mismatch repair protein status, and led the FDA to actually grant accelerated approval to pembrolizumab uh, for first uh, tissue site agnostic of indication based on MMR status. Uh, we quickly have to talk about checkpoint blockage, and I'm mindful of the time, so I, I won't be going over the detail uh, of this paper, uh, of this slide, but uh, it suffice to say that uh, PDL1 and CTLA4, uh, which make up uh, the uh, checkpoint uh, blockade within many tumors, um, uh, are more and more the targets of uh, immunomodulary therapy. And uh, a lot has been written and um, added for PDL1 IHC. 
uh, based uh, especially on some of the antibodies which are companion to the drugs that are currently available. And there's only uh, two manufacturers, namely DACO and Ventana. But of uh, issues surround the positive cutoff for PD-01HC, as well as the uh, cells examined for it. Do you examine the tumor cells? Do you examine the immune cells? So um, I think uh, pd one assays um, for selecting patients in colorectal cancer uh, is, is, um, is, is the early phases. So a lot of these antibody clones and cutoffs have not been extensively studied in colorectal cancer and have, uh, in fact, um, be employed more in the uh, pulmonary world. Um, and uh, uh, on that note, uh, the uh, uh, Checkmate 142 study, which looked at a pd one inhibitor in patients with metastat uh, metastatic mismatch repair deficient um, colorectal cancer, actually I, uh, did do um, IHC staining for pd one with a 1% positive cutoff. And Results uh, in the discussion, they, they know that um, uh, PL1 in their cohort was not predictive of a biomarker, and it really raises the uh, possibility, uh, the question as to whether PL1 uh, IHC is of all of use in colorectal cancer, and if uh, oncologists are not better off using the MMR status uh, to rect immunomodulary therapy. What are the uh, summary points from that aspect? is so that the detection of MMR protein deficiency is applicated to screen for Lynch syndrome and is prognostically significant. And uh, MMR protein deficiency is an important predictive biomarker, particular for immunotherapy. And um, it is currently used to select patients for immune checkpoint blockade using some of the anti-PD-1 therapies in GI tract carcinomas. And I that's uh, part of the reason we're seeing more and more requests uh, from oncologists uh, to test uh, solid tumors for um, MR uh, by HC. And I think that's my last slide. Uh, so uh, thank you much for giving me the opportunity to, to share this with you. And uh, I think I'll back over to you, Aaron, uh, at this point. Thank you very much. That was a uh, excellent talk. And uh, your illustrations of some of these controversial issues was uh, wonderful. So it's Couple questions that came in, and the first one's from uh, Julianor in uh, Edmonton, and that's how do you grade mucinous colorectal adenocarcinoma? Uh, uh, that, that's uh, that's uh, that's an excellent question. Um, so uh, the the problem is is that um, there is um, difference in opinion as to um, how to go about. This one, uh, should all mucinous adenocarcinomas be uh, graded as poorly differentiated? Uh, should one look at the uh, grading within the tumor of, uh, to, to see whether this is uh, well or moderately differentiated? And then does the grading of mucinous adenocarcinomas in the uh, colon actually correlate uh, to the outcome? And know uh, that some uh, mucinous adenocarcinomas, in fact, fall within the Lynch syndrome. Uh, and uh, if you do MMR staining of them, uh, a good number of them uh, is, in fact, MMR deficient uh, and would uh, respond well in that regard. However, if you are a purist and, and follow the guidelines, um, mucinous adenocarcinoma is recommended uh, to be uh, graded within the uh, poor uh, differentiation. So you change your grade based on the MMR MSI status? I, I don't want to sound dogmatic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's Go ahead. Depending on, uh, on, on who your audience is. Um, so uh, I, 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 uh, I, I have to admit I have not uh, changed my uh, grading based on MSI status. So there's a uh, additional question, and that is, are your oncologists asking for MMR, MSI status of metastatic colorectal cancer? Yeah, uh, in, in fact, I had two phone calls this morning just before I came in asking for uh, MMR status on uh, one was a metastatic colorectal to the liver. The other one was an intrahepatic cholangial uh, carcinoma that has now become metastatic. So I think uh, every oncology uh, conference you go to, um, uh, is the, 
the uh, GI oncologists high fiving each other that they don't have to rely on PBL1 IHC, but can use MMR staining to guide their treatment decisions for immunomodulary therapy. Uh, so, as this becomes more and more um, distributed amongst the oncology world, we'll be seeing more and more requests of this coming in. The next question is related to BRAF, and that's how often do you use BRAF immunochemistry on colorectal cancer for BRAF mutational analysis? Uh, yeah, so this is a, a local decision that was made in our institution. This is that we, in fact, do reflex BRAF B600 EIHC testing. Um, our argumentation behind that is, is that as I showed you in that graph as to what results mean, uh, while it is not just helpful in identifying or, or differentiating line from sporadic uh, LH1 hypermethylation, it also is in itself a prognostic factor. And um, in, uh, uh, in uh, discussions with our um, uh, uh, tumor group, um, we have decided that this is a prognostic marker that we want to offer up front. Do it on all of them, but understand that that cost uh, can be very prohibitive to this, um, given that uh, it's one of the more expensive IHCs. Um, so we uh, uh, another approach would be to only do it in those uh, that are MLH1 uh, deficient by IHC, and you know that or, or um, that this is about uh, 15 to 16 percent, or should be in that range. Um, and we use uh, BRAF uh, PCR for uh, equivocal IHC staining. So our fixation becomes an issue where you just have this very faint staining uh, where there may have been a technical issue. We then use BRAF to confirm that. So this is our, but I, I understand that this is a very local algorithm to assess BRAF. How often do you have to resort to molecular uh, assessment for BRAF? It's, it's very uh, little. Uh, in our most uh, recent audit of, of 2017, um, we did uh, um, we did uh, over uh, 600 uh, MMR tests on colorectal cancer, and uh, we only sent about 5% of the BRAF IHC for confirmatory um, PCR. So it's it's a it's a small number. The next question is, can you comment on prognosis for PT1 or PT2 tumors with intramural V invasion? PT1 and PT2 tumors with but zero, I presume. I presume so. But intramural venous invasion. Yeah. So um, if we go back uh, to the slide, I think I actually demonstrated it. So I can sh I, I, I fully admit that I don't have the numbers. Uh, oh, I see why why you're asking this. <laughs> yes, intramural uh, versus extramural. Um, so, uh, in a PT2 lesion, you wouldn't have extramural uh, invasion. Um, so uh, I, I, I guess I'm, uh, the question here being is what is the prognosis of venous invasion? Uh, so in a PT1 lesion, uh, we could uh, use the example uh, that we use in the malignant uh, polyp uh, that um, lymph the uh, Uenos paper stipulates uh, that uh, if you have lymphovascular invasion only, your risk of original lymph node metastasis is in the range of 15%. Um, so uh, you you could extrapolate that um, isolated uh, venous invasion in the setting of a T1, T2 lesion uh, would be in the realm of, of uh, 15 to 20%. Um, uh, and I think that that is reflective of the uh, NCCN guidelines uh, stipulating this as a high risk factor in those stage two lesions. All right. The next uh, has to do with rectal cancers and treatment. And this is, what is your approach to rectal tumors with complete response post-treatment? Um, I, I guess this is going along the lines as to how, uh, how would one assess uh, a treatment response? Um, well, it's complete 
uh, response post-treatment. So I don't know whether that has to do with grossing or reporting. Uh, yeah, so um, I, I think so for reporting, um, uh, the, the CAP guidelines, again, gives you um, a nice example as to how to report in general uh, treatment response, that is, if you know about it, uh, which obviously is, is uh, uh, sometimes difficult uh, in terms of communication. Uh, but uh, in terms of um, uh, what the oncologists do or, or how uh, this lesion, these lesions are being handled, um, uh, they would still go on for a surveillance uh, protocol. And uh, the, the key feature in this is to ensure that uh, your lymph node count is adequate uh, to not miss uh, any kind of regional lymph node metastasis. I don't know if I answered the question correctly on this point, but uh, I, I don't quite understand what the, uh, what it was pertaining to. Okay. Well, um, if there's a follow-up, please feel free to use the chat feature. Um, there is an additional question that came in at the same time, and that's the approach to G3 neuroendocrine tumors. Ah, uh, yeah, uh, fun topic. <laughs> so, um, so we're a bit of limbo right now when it comes to neuroendocrine tumors. And the reason for that being is, is that the WHO uh, for GI tumors is currently uh, still, or the one current in use is the uh, 2010 edition, which uh, uses a classification system for neuroendocrine tumors uh, that will be superseded once uh, the new edition comes out. And being told that this happened this year. What is currently being available is the classification of neuroendocrine tumors in the pancreas, which is printed in the, um, uh, in the neuroendocrine uh, WHO guidelines. And it probably almost deserves a, a talk in itself, but uh, let me summarize as to what we can surmise from the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, which in all likelihood will also be used uh, for um, colorectal or gastrointestinal neuroendocrine tumors. And that is that we now differentiate neuroendocrine tumor from neuroendocrine carcinoma predominantly based on morphology. And near that is that you can, a neuroendocrine carcinoma, show morphology that is reminiscent of a small cell or large cell carcinoma as we know it so well from the lung. Endocrine tumor is differentiated as we know it based on T67 as well as mitotic index assessment. The problem comes in the neuroendocrine tumor grade 3. Because grade 3, as before, was defined or still defined in the pancreatic world, which we think will be used for the colorectal world, as more than 20% T67 or mitotic count, but less than 50. Now, you would assume that the cutoff for neuroendocrine carcinoma for the best assessment would also start at 50, but it doesn't. It starts also at 20%. And testimony to that, and to confuse everybody even further, um, that now there are two grade three, the neuroendocrine tumor grade three, and there's a neuroendocrine carcinoma grade three. And this wasn't just made up with a couple of people having too many beers after ASCAP. There's actually a scientific um, reason for it. And that is that there is a um, big overlap between some neuroendocrine tumors that have a high mitotic index but not have morphology reminiscent of small or large cell carcinoma and some neuroendocrine carcinomas that do look like, like small or large cell carcinoma. So uh, with that in mind, uh, it, I know this area is confusing, uh, but the point is, Morphology trumps uh, T67 and my top index when it comes to assessment of neuroendocrine carcinoma. And we now have uh, two uh, trees, uh, one in neuroendocrine tumor and one in the neuroendocrine carcinoma tar. <laughs> yeah, it, it certainly is a, a confusing topic. That was a, that was a great summary of the uh, issues. Next question has to do with uh, elastin stains. And that is, do you yeah. do elastin stains for perirectal tumor deposits to rule out uh, venous invasion? I do. Um, 
so the the question is uh, again as to what is your laboratory's policy uh, if you are um, a strong believer and I hope that um, most of the data I, I showed you today, if not are yet the believer, will turn you into believer. Uh, we advocate for doing upfront elastin stains on um, at least uh, the um, tumor with the deepest point of lesion. And I'm aware of several labs across the country where this has become a standard or, or routine assessment. Or you can take an approach if, uh, if turnaround time is not of your utmost importance. Uh, where you do selective elastin stains um, on uh, uh, that you identify on H and E uh, to be of uh, importance. Uh, I have to fully admit that I subscribe to the second approach, um, but uh, that it simply has to do with uh, that uh, we just don't have the volume uh, to do it upfront on all of our cases. Okay. And so that goes with the follow-up. Quest, uh, an additional question that had to do with, do you suggest doing elastic stains on all blocks with tumor? So you get your biggest bang for the buck in, in the deepest invasion portion. I think if you have, uh, if you gross it yourself, you, you know exactly which block this will be. If you have a very well a trained um, pathologist assistant, you could, um, you could discuss that topic with them in depth. So, um, again, there is uh, different uh, data out there uh, demonstrating that uh, in some uh, recommendations to do it on all tumor blocks and some to do it on the one that have uh, the deepest point of infusion. Sounds dogmatic, um, but I think, again, if, if you have the proper um, grossing technique, uh, then you probably... Uh, get most of it at the point of the deepest invasion. Um, but if you're not that comfortable with yet, one approach may be to do it on all tumor blocks as you start off and you become more familiar with that uh, parameter. Now, the next question has to do with uh, uh, the vein, uh, the venous uh, invasion the medial wall, and that's the vein remnant you described. Did you find it because of the presence of the medial wall of the vein. So the deposit identified within the vein was ruptured and there was infiltrated into the surrounding adipose tissue, considered N1C. Yeah, excellent question. Um, so I didn't show you the elastin stain, which I did on that. So, but yes, there's the medial wall and then the elastin stain also showed it. So that made it uh, a venous remnant. The, the perforation within uh, the soft, assuming soft tissue does not, if, you, if you're a purist and follow uh, the AGCC uh, guidelines, make it an N1C because it arose within a vessel. Uh, so, but you, uh, who, whoever asked the question, nailed the problem <laughs> because uh, why is that change being made? And the change is being made. Uh, because of the nebulous area that was surrounding N1C. Uh, because as I, as I was hoping to demonstrate to you, uh, that even fault expert gastrointestinal pathologists cannot 100% agree as to what is N1C. So now we really have to take everything that's associated with a nerve or a vein, a venous invasion, out of the equation, and once you have... Um, sufficiently convinced ourselves that that's not present, then one can only go into N1C. Now, I already uh, imagine the follow-up question, or uh, that, which is, well, if I didn't cut deep enough into the tumor deposit, and uh, what if there isn't a vein allowing it? And this, to the point, although it, stays, it changes the staging, at the end of the day, in this particular setting, if you have no other lymph nodes present, meaning you are a stage two or stage three uh, patient, it, it doesn't really change the follow-up for the patient that much because the stage two patient um, may have other high-risk features, as I listed in the NCCN guidelines for lymph node negative colorectal cancer, which may force or may convince Theologist to offer this patient adjuvant chemotherapy. So I don't negate the importance of N1C or the importance.
importance of human invasion, but I also don't want anybody to go um, uh, to become very paranoid about that aspect, because I think the importance highlights uh, that the downstream uh, implications of that are, are, are minimal. I'm going to jump down to the comment that came in, and that's from a believer that uh, uses MOVAT, but not on all tumor slides. And MOVAT better than elastin stain because the, the the additional color that you get. So which stain do you advocate, uh, or which stain do you use in Vancouver? Yeah, it's, it's very dependent on the day of the week. Uh, it seems to be um, uh, if the air conditioning is hot. No, uh, listen. I think there's so much interlaboratory variation uh, in these stains. Um, we have now what we call a modified MOVAT, uh, and uh, that seems to work very well. Um, at the end of the day, uh, an elastin stain, uh, whatever is your choice, what works for you, which one you're comfortable employing, uh, by all means, uh, try it out. But I think uh, a comment is, is, is maybe a testimony to the fact that um, uh, we uh, we have a huge variation in our special stains in our laboratories, and uh, uh, maybe this is an area um, of uh, increased or where we should be putting uh, um, more efforts into ensuring standardization and ensuring that uh, we get these stains right all the time. And I'm very much uh, happy to look forward to pointers because by no means are our stains always perfect. Gears a little bit. The next question is. How significant are isolated tumor cells in lymph nodes? Um, so uh, uh, the um, uh, again, the the literature differs on that. Um, breast um, isolated tumor cells have not been shown to be as different in colorectal cancer as they are in breast and. It's my personal uh, opinion, and I'm backed up by 50% of the literature, that related tumor cells uh, should be counted as a P, uh, as an N1. Um, and uh, I know I, uh, I, I can be um, proven wrong by multiple uh, papers uh, that demonstrate that isolated tumor cells uh, do have uh, an impact on survival. But uh, whenever it comes up and whenever um, uh, this being asked, I ask myself is, in the colorectum, uh, do we have evidence to argue that you should not be giving adjuvant chemotherapy in a patient uh, that has isolated tumor cells only? And then I would argue uh, that my favorite uh, report is the report that states you have colorectal cancer with isolated tumor cells but no lymphovascular invasion. And I get, uh, um, uh, not takes off, but uh, a question as to how that is possible. And I think it goes back to uh, understanding what the oncologist would do at the other end. Uh, and uh, as such, um, I stand strong, uh, as I said, with backed up with part of the literature uh, that in my books, um, isolated uh, tumor cells in the colorectum uh, do not exist. Um. Just uh, as an aside question, then, do you ever do keratin immunous chemistry on lymph nodes to look for isolated tumor cells? Not on a team basis. I do not. Um, I do it on individual selected cases uh, where um, uh, I know that this is incredibly subjective, uh, subjective to say, but uh, as a practicing pathologist, you very much understand what I mean by that. If it looks funny, if it doesn't look right, uh, then I will resort to keratin, but I do not do it on a routine basis. Okay. Now, uh, the next question is tumor budding, and that's how reproducible are tumor budding slash grain counts? Uh, it, a great question. Um, so there have been uh, multiple papers uh, published on inter-observer variability, especially based on um, the late latest uh, consensus guide or including those latest consensus guidelines. There has been one uh, or, or from North America, and this is by uh, the Pai brothers, um, Rish and Ritesh Pai, uh, which uh, looked at the first North American cohort uh, applying uh, stringent criteria for that. 
Uh, so they are um, producible uh, once you do um, pay attention to it. There, there is variation when it comes to uh, those difficult uh, areas that I mentioned. Um, but I think, you know, uh, to my wedding, um, I, I know there's apprehension within the pathology community for this. And uh, I, I, would, I would just urge you to have an open mind. Um, the app guidelines is, is excellent in summarizing the approach to it. Um, in going, uh, in assessing them, I think you'll, you'll realize uh, that most of the times the cutoff is quite clear. Uh, they're there um, or it's not there. And uh, I think it's just another parameter that uh, we, we need to assess and we need to assess because uh, it makes sense from uh, biology and it makes sense from uh, overall uh, patient outcome. Now, uh, the question regarding mismatch repair uh, immunochemistry, and that is, do you do two or four stains for MMR? Excellent question. Uh, so we do a two-stain approach, um, and this has simply to do with uh, cost effectiveness. Um, the um, sensitivity um, um, uh, of it is comparable. Um, but you have to be mindful as to uh, which things uh, you, uh, you order. Uh, so um, you you have to um, order the or, or start off with the, the I don't want to call submissive heterodimer and not the dominant heterodimer. But uh, uh, it has shown in our lab where we do it reflex wise for uh, both colorectal and endometrial uh, that uh, in our audits uh, the two stain is as effective as the four stain in identifying mismatch repair deficiency. Okay. Uh, a follow up question on that. How often do you do, you do MSI? Staining from the uh, staining, uh, MSI molecular analysis. Um, so, uh, the, uh, this is something very unique uh, to uh, British Columbia, where uh, MSI testing is actually centralized. It's within our hereditary cancer clinic. Um, so, uh, I, I can't give you a exact number. To how it's being done. In part, uh, it depends very much as to the genetic counselor and the medical geneticist uh, feeling confident that the patient with an MMR result um, and some history fits uh, criteria without the need for germline uh, confirmation. Um, so uh, there, there is no uh, exact number. Uh, however, we do an audit uh, to do that and uh, we uh, confirm our mismatch repair deficiency rate um, uh, uh, on a yearly basis with MSI PCR on follow-up. Okay. Now, another question related to the assessment of rectal cancers following treatment. That is, how do you report the margins, for example, with fibrosis or mucin for rectal cancers with a complete response to therapy? Yeah. That's an excellent question. So um, I reported, so, so one has to be careful and not to, uh, so I, I, the question pertains to the margin and not the, the depth of envision. So um, one has to be uh, careful as to um, uh, fibrosis is in fact, um, uh, tumor fibrosis and what is secondary to treatment. Now, mucin is easier, right, because mucin uh, stipulates, especially if you're primary with a mucinous colorectal adenocarcinoma, that this is, in fact, remnant of uh, colorectal cancer. Fibrosis is more difficult, and um, I will state that. I will say, uh, uh, not be, uh, trying to be dogmatic, but I will say that if there is fibrosis present at the margin, uh, without any epithelial cells present in the setting of a patient who had uh, ideation, for instance, I am not able to tell the difference. And I think in that setting uh, to, uh, to admit uh, that uh, the morphology does not allow uh, for a, um, uh, a definitive answer. I'm going to ask a related question, and that is, how do you handle acellular mucin in lymph nodes on resected specimens? 
So uh, provided I've uh, cut through the uh, entire thing and um, uh, thrown out my earlier comment about never doing keratin, but now have a keratin and there's nothing present, um, uh, I will then report that uh, as such. And um, if there's no other lymph node present and I find myself in the setting of changing a patient from a stage two to a stage three, uh, I will comment on such. And uh, again, uh, my approach to it is pragmatic as to what does it mean for this particular patient. Acylmucin does not appear in a lymph node on its own. I will convey that in my report to the oncologist. It's been a, a wonderful session. Thank you very much, David. Uh, I'm just going to draw everybody's attention to a comment that came through, and that is that the link was missing from the pre-meeting information page. The link is actually provided under the chat. So if, uh, for anybody that uh, wants to uh, click on that or copy that, um, it's easier to draw your attention there than for me to try to uh, give you all the exact numbers. The will also be resent with the, uh, sorry, the um, info will also be sent with the link attached. So if you're looking for the link, it's not there, look for the follow-up uh, email message. Now, on behalf of the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, Cancer Care Ontario, and the Canadian Association of Pathologists, I'd like to thank Dr. Schaefer for a great presentation today. As a reminder, both the live and recorded presentations are eligible for continuing education credits. To request your certificate of participation, please provide your name and email address at the provided. You'll also find a optional session evaluation form, which we encourage you to complete. The information collected through this session evaluations allows us to ensure that the sessions continue to be informative and relevant to your practice. We appreciate your feedback and suggestions and additional information in the notice. One of the further uh, catalyst uh, education session coming up, and that is on April 11th. And Dr. Julia Keith will be talking about brain and CNS tumors. To David and for everybody uh, participating today.